Well, what a blessing it is to be able to be used of the Lord. I'm going to be sharing my personal testimony. Years ago, I shared it, but the quality wasn't that great, and I would much prefer to give greater exposure to anybody else's testimony. But uh, I just feel the Holy Spirit said to do an update on mine, so I'm going to be obedient to that. And I feel that God has said to read my testimony out of the Real Life Stories uh, Testimony Book Edition 6 that we're making available to anybody who would like copies of that. And we've been putting out for years and years. And so in the Real Life Stories Edition 6 Testimony Book Chapter 20 is my condensed testimony, very condensed so, uh, let's get on with it. It's titled, I was troubled. I was a troubled military vet looking <clears throat> for happiness. Um, Father, I pray that you give me a voice strong enough to uh, share this without too many disruptions. At age 18, I enlisted in the Army. A few days before Christmas of 1967, I landed foot on the shores of Vietnam, full of fear and apprehension. In Vietnam, I was assigned to be a prisoner of war interrogator at the field level. Our main objective was to help save the lives of our fellow soldiers by providing accurate and timely information about the enemy's activities. We were also trying to stop the communists from taking over South Vietnam. In seeking information from prisoners, creative interrogation techniques were sometimes used that inflicted a lot of pain. These techniques were designed to extract information from hardcore prisoners. Otherwise, they wouldn't reveal information they had. This helped deaden my conscience to the value of life I may have had prior to going to Vietnam. As all combat vets do, I experienced firsthand the horrors and injustices of war. My concept of an all-loving, all-merciful, all-compassionate God being in control of this planet drastically began to alter my belief about him. Seeing all the pain the Vietnam conflict was bringing to the lives of so many people, including mine, I wasn't sure I wanted to put my trust in any supposed God who allowed such things to happen. In order to put the whole nightmare behind me and get on with my life, as best as I could, I came back from Vietnam a hardcore alcoholic and a chronic smoker. I had a heart as cold as steel. My wife had an emotionally unstable and troubled husband to deal with, although I certainly was in denial to that. I'm thankful to be alive, but I left Vietnam very emotionally troubled. I was thankful to be alive but I left Vietnam very emotionally troubled. I was quick to find fault in Christians and organized religion as well. I was totally unaware of the devil's influence over my thinking. Like many others, I felt that all churches wanted was try to control you and con you out of your money. Alcoholism, anger, emotional instability, and stress continue to take their ugly toll on me. Near age 35, I was told unexpectedly by a nurse at work that my heart was like a walking time bomb ready to explode. My heart was ready to quit any moment due to extreme high blood pressure. I was sleeping very little, smoking three packs of cigarettes a day and drinking beer, wine, and close to a half a fifth of hard liquor each day. I was trying to cope with both emotional and physical pain. I had started developing 
severe back and leg issues by that time as well. When I was told that I had to quit smoking and drinking or else suffer a heart attack, part of me didn't care if I died. In my mind, it was a way out of my pain and misery. After all, it would be death through, quote, natural causes, unquote, who would ever know the real reason? In 1980, near age 35, I was a wreck. I was facing death by my own choosing. I wasn't convinced in my heart that I would go to heaven. My marriage had essentially dissolved. My life was in shambles. I had two precious children who did not have a suitable father and an emotionally strained wife who did not have a suitable husband. I would reached a place in my life where I felt like death seemed the only way out. Yet I really didn't want to die either. All I really wanted was to have a purpose for living that I just wasn't able to find, no matter how hard I tried, and a little happiness that lasted longer than another drug-induced high. Despair descended upon me, and fear of dying began to suddenly plague my thoughts. What if there really was a heaven and a hell? How could I actually prove there wasn't? If there actually was a heaven and a hell, once on the other side, what assurance did I have of having a second chance to get right with God? All I had ever done was live for myself. What would God find in me that would make him want to let me be in heaven with him? I had no valid reasons I could come up with. My despair eventually turned to desperation. That night, after the nurse informed me of my dangerous high blood pressure, I cried out to God all night long, starting on a Thursday night with nothing happening. Friday evening, I went to bed like I had done the night before. I started crying out to Jesus again. Quote, if there's a Jesus who can hear me or wants to hear me, let me know. Let me know if you're real. I, I, I do want to serve the real God, but I've got to know you are real. I've got to know if you really care for me. I cried and agonized to God until the wee hours of dawn, but all I heard was silence. God, do you even hear me? More silence. I finally gave up. What a fool I felt I had been to cry out like this all night long. Two nights, in fact. I rationalized thinking that maybe God would have compassion on me and somehow reveal his reality, me, reality uh, to me in a way that I wasn't so doubtful and confused about him. But nothing. Daybreak was just starting that early Saturday morning, and then it happened. The bedroom instantly became about 30% brighter. I looked for a light to be on, but none was. I thought maybe the sun was now up. I thought maybe I'd fallen asleep and had awakened hours later, but the clock said differently. No, I wasn't imagining it, nor was I dreaming it. The light was real. It was of equal intensity throughout the room. An invisible presence was in my room. The reason I know so was because an indescribable love was so strong in that room that it seemed there was not enough room to contain it all. I felt like I was being shoved back by a big hand into my bed. The love was so strong. And I knew, don't ask me how I knew, I just knew that I knew that I knew that it was the presence of Jesus Christ in my room. At that moment, he spoke very powerfully to me. It wasn't audibly, but powerfully to my inner being. I've come to realize he spoke to my spirit, which is a common way for him to speak to people. That realization came later. 
the intensity of it was so strong that I might just as well have been it just as well it might just as well have been audible. It was that loud to me. He told me what I had to do to make my relationship work with him. Instantly, all the anguish, pain, misery, confusion, and doubt of a lifetime were sucked out of me. All that was left was peace and knowing that God is real. The room instantly was darkened again as before. The presence of Christ was now gone. The whole thing didn't take more than a few moments to happen, but happen it did. I was now a believer. Moments later, I pulled the covers off from me, sat on the side of the bed, and made a solemn vow to God. I said, thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to me in a way that I can believe in you. I know I deserve, I know I don't deserve what just happened here, and I promise to serve you the rest of my life. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I'm only being honest in saying that I owe God everything for what he did to help me realize who he truly was and is. He's granted me the desire of my heart, which is to give me a purpose for living. I have his eternal purpose in mind, which is to be used of him to tell others about who Jesus Christ truly is and what he did for me and others on the cross. And to help new Christians gain a more solid foundation on which to build their relationship with Jesus Christ on. If, you're all, if you are as skeptical as I once was about the importance of serving Jesus Christ, all I can suggest is that you get as desperate as you know how to seek him and never stop seeking him. Ask him to reveal to you who he truly is and what he did for you, of course, on the cross. A great deal of the time, God doesn't come through for us like we might like him to until we get desperate enough. I believe he will often force us to come to a place of desperation before he manifests himself to us because most people won't really serve him all that much afterwards once he begins to reveal truth about himself to them unless it truly costs them something. That cost? Pain. Pain has a way of making you appreciate what is truly valuable. Please allow me to insert some very important reality to those who are bound up in doubt and unbelief about being blinded to biblical spiritual truth like I was. And boy was I ever. One of the most priceless things God has done for me is to free me to understand that there is an intense spiritual battle going on in the unseen realm to influence the thinking of mankind. Satan and the demons who served him are not, quote, made up, unquote. They're not make-believe characters. They are fallen angels. There are fallen angels in the unseen realm serving Satan. Serving Satan, who God has allowed for a season to have huge influence over mankind to do Satan's deceptive bidding. Every one of us are engaged in this spiritual battle of good and evil our whole life. It is waged against our mind 24-7. Satan endlessly works at trying to get us to think contrary to the way the Holy Spirit wants us to think and then act without getting caught at it. For those who purpose to be victorious in this spiritual battle, God has given humanity his written word, the Holy Bible, and the Holy Spirit to help them understand correctly the Bible and to help 
them control their thoughts and actions. After all, our actions follow our thoughts. Satan fully understands that, which is why he constantly tries to subtly manipulate what we think and then believe. After many years of walking with the Lord, I've learned that Jesus Christ wants first place in our lives daily, and Satan hates it when we give Jesus first place. And Satan has a myriad of ways to distract us if we let him. Jesus co-created each of us. Uh, it's not written here, but I just want to add, he co-created us with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus co-created each of us so he can be fully trusted to help us live this life to the fullest in alignment with his truth, which is the Holy Bible. Yet he won't force himself upon us. We must demonstrate to him that we daily desire his supernatural ability to guide our lives. As with any meaningful relationship, it requires our active pursuit. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is no different. Yet Jesus only invites he never forces anyone to give their all to him. It's a choice he wants everyone making. Yet eternity will be filled with those who rejected him. If you haven't made a decision to trust the one who knows what is best for you, do yourself the biggest favor you could do for yourself. Be wise enough to place your trust in the one with a big O, the one who paid full penalty for all your past, present, and future sins. So you could be forgiven, justified, and made fully righteous in his eyes. His plans to bless you and use you to co-reign with him through eternity. Don't spend eternity regretting what eternity could have been for you in and through Jesus Christ. Don't reject his great free gift of eternal salvation. What will be your decision? You have no assurance of another heartbeat. None of us do. Be wise. Make him your savior and let him be Lord in every area of your life. It is the wisest decision you will ever make. So, with that, if you got this far, I thank you for letting me share this again. Uh, this is coming from the Real Life Stories Edition 6 Testimony Book. Um, the Precious Testimonies of Ministry uh, has made mention of this book as well as many other editions that um, have been and are being made available to put out like um, big thick Holy Ghost anointed tracks okay um, and it's been a privilege to be able to pass them out for many many years and make them available to others and uh, just to be used of the Lord in any way that he would have us, my wife and I, to be used to bring glory to him. I end up telling most everybody that I can, I owe God. I owe God. I owe God. I just essentially took up space for the first 35 years of my life looking for happiness. That's normal. All of us just want some happiness. God understands that. But I was looking for happiness every place else but in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Being Lord of my life. Not just Savior. Lord. Lord means he's the most important thing daily for me to think about, talk to, and ask for help from he wants us to demonstrate that to him. 
It is so important, I have found, to just accept Jesus as our personal Savior, thank Him for paying the penalty for our sins, occasionally asking forgiveness so our slate is clean. That's a good start. But letting Him be Lord of our lives, whoa, that's costly. That's costly. And it is something that we need all of the help of the Holy Spirit we can get to make that number one priority in our lives after we've accepted him to be our savior. And my friend, this is January about 7th. I haven't checked, but if you look back at January 7th, years from now, you will realize that we have a great deal of conflict going on uh, around the world and uh, I can't stress it enough. Get close to Jesus. Learn to hear what he has to say about matters. Learn to persist and persevere until you're convinced he's telling you what to do. Because the, the battle of good and evil is intensifying. And it's going to intensify most likely unlike ever before. If you read Matthew chapter 24 briefly, at the beginning, it, the disciples that were had access to Jesus says, "Tell us about the end time. Tell us when you're. Tell us about what it's going to look like when you return back to Earth. Give us give us some clues, if you would. The first thing Jesus says is, "Beware of deception." The first thing. There's a lot of other things that are said as you read through Matthew 24, but beware. Of deception that would first and foremost be spiritual deception the the battle of good and evil Satan we're not to fear him but we're not to underestimate his ability that God has allowed him to have and his wisdom to deceive us deceive mankind and uh, so I'll just leave you with that Walk as close to Jesus Christ. When you walk as close to Jesus Christ, we're talking about God the Father and God the Holy Spirit because they're all one, but we zero in on Jesus Christ is because he's the one that uh, the other two persons of the God had sent to die and pay the penalty for our sins. He deserves the honor and glory for it. And so that's why we mention Jesus Christ. Personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the most important thing any of us can do. Go out knowing you have peace with your creator and your judge, the judge of every person. For Christians, it won't be judgment of sin. It will be a judgment of rewards, given rewards. But there are warnings that not everybody receives the same rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. This is the, the judgment for Christians. Some will receive a loss of rewards. Some will have a gain of rewards. We're not told a whole lot about it. Some will be saved from their sins as by fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 addresses that issue. So my friend, get squeaky clean and stay squeaky clean by the help of the Holy Spirit and your determination to walk upright in obedience to Jesus Christ in alignment with his wisely interpreted, wisely applied New Testament word. God bless.